Well, good morning, everyone. Here we are in Florence, Massachusetts, a village two and a half miles, three miles north of Northampton. And we're going to talk this morning about the Northampton Association of Education and Industry, a long name for a, uh, a utopian community that was established here in April of 1842. People came here to band together for women's rights, for the, the rights of African Americans, and one of the most unique features of the Northampton Association was that women and African Americans had an equal say in what went on here. At one point there were as many as a hundred, probably 180 people living here. Uh, 240 total people lived here at one time or another. We're up here on a corner that actually uh, was a, a place that this community moved to after their days of intense intercooperation, which ended in 1846. Many of the people uh, that were around at the end of that of the association, its four and a half year run, decided they wanted to stay here, and we're up in the neighborhood the bulk of them moved to right now. And this is also where Sojourner Truth moved to, and we're right at the site of her statue. She lived a little ways down Park Street from where we're standing now, and she came here in 1843, fairly early on in the, uh, the community's life. And when she saw the place, it was such a hard scrabble, difficult kind of existence these people were eking out for themselves that she only was going to stay a day and move on. But because she became inspired, like many others, with their, the nobility of their character, basically, for standing for the principles they wanted to stand for at that point, she stayed on here in Florence for 14 years. So one question we might ask ourselves is why did Sojourner Truth pick the Northampton Association as a place to stop? The, the association began as a grouping of abolitionists who were, in a sense, disciples of William Lloyd Garrison, who had founded The Liberator in 1831, which was the, really the first magazine calling for the immediate emancipation of the slaves. This was a totally radical notion in Massachusetts, which really wasn't as radical as we like to think of our state at this point. But uh, so here, uh, Garrison had met uh, the sister, the sister of George W. Benson down in Brooklyn, Connecticut. And they would work together on an anti-slavery case down there, uh, the Prudence Crandall case, which we may talk about at some point. And uh, so Benson heard about this, this place up here and decided with Samuel Hill, with William Adam, with David Mack, other abolitionists and industrialists really, that they were going to form a community here and, uh, and actually fight slavery from this vantage point. Uh, this was like an outpost of Boston. The Garrison Center was in Boston. Here was an outpost where they could get a little respite out in the country, gather their, gather their strength as they went out on the circuit speaking against slavery. So many people, Erasmus Darwin Hudson, a very interesting character, came here as a member and would, wasn't here that often. He would be here for a while, talk with his compatriots, and then go off on a speaking tour. <clears throat> after a certain point, Sojourner Truth herself, somewhat after the community broke up, became, Garrison realized um, that, that here was a figure. She was almost six feet tall. She was a spellbinding speaker and singer. And, she incur and so he encouraged her both by publishing, helping her publish her narrative, but also realized that she would be great out on the stump. So he and Wendell Phillips and others encouraged her uh, to do that. Frederick Douglass came here on occasion. We know of maybe three or four times he came to the association. And he had published his narrative in 1845. And so that became something she looked at, I believe, as a way for her to make a little money without having to work for white folks in their houses as a domestic. And so on, when she was out on the stump, she would do that, sell her little narrative, give her speeches, and also sell pictures of herself. I sell the shadow to support the substance was what she spoke about uh, when she was trying to sell the cards out there. Now we're gonna move on from this spot dedicated to Sojourner Truth 
and uh, see some of the other sites that uh, relate to the utopian community here in Florence. And one of the great things about Florence is that there are a lot of them. So we will have to actually pick and choose some of the best. We've walked a, uh, about 100 feet from the uh, Sojourner statue at this point, and we're standing in the Pine Grove. This is how, that's the name it was known by. It's been known by that since the 1840s. We were in the Pine Grove. And in the summertime, let's call them the Utopians, but the members of the Northampton Association uh, would meet here in the shade of the, of the pine uh, trees, and in particular one 150-foot tall old-growth pine tree was here. And in, underneath that pine tree, perhaps in keeping with the Native American tradition of speaking under certain trees and giving certain trees a special, a special purpose, uh, many speakers who would visit the Northampton Association would come here on a Sunday and talk. And among them would be Wendell Phillips, Frederick Douglass. Garrison himself would be here, in fact stayed here in the summertime, so he would be one of the principal speakers. Uh, and I wanted to read, if I could, uh, just briefly a, a, a article from the Massachusetts Whig, which was a newspaper, and they reprinted it in the uh, Daily Hampshire Gazette. And it was on the 17th day of September. Um, here they are. The, brought with us all the loveliness which a charming autumnal summer can produce. And here we are uh, on just such a day, a beautiful day here in Florence. <clears throat> Combined indeed might be the attractions amid a thin, thinly populated wild bordering upon the teeming valley of the Mill River. Such an abode would seem a fit haunt for weary mortals to retire from the jargon of a tumultuous world and cultivate a closer community with the heavenly author. And it seemed that such an advantage had been taken of this place as the uncouth assemblage before might indicate. Behold them, the representatives of the various nations of the earth, congregated beneath a wide-spreading pine tree to worship the god of their spiritual conceptions. Having become dissatisfied with the order of things around them, these men had gathered from distant and varied climes into one vicinity to carry on their new principles of action. So if we speed ahead 10 years from uh, that point or a little further in history to 1856, everything has changed here in Florence. The utopian community broke up 10 years ago, but most of them that were there at the end have settled down and are now in what we've uh, come to call the neighborhood community. And that was established up near the statue. Uh, many people lived up that way, but they would still gather here in the pine grove. Florence, uh, up until 18, the early 1850s, was actually a destination on the Underground Railroad. It wasn't just that people were passing through to get up to Canada, though that happened, and Samuel Hill and Elisha Hammond, Northampton Association members were involved in that. And then later, J.P. Williston, who came up, he was involved in that. But a unique feature of Florence is that this was a destination, and, and fugitive slaves actually got jobs here in the mills. So it's a, a little different than other places uh, involved in the Underground Railroad. After, 18, after the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850, Sojourner Truth, who had worked so hard to get her house here, spent most of the rest of her time in Florence out on the road, on the stump, along with Frederick Douglass, along with others. There was nothing that inspired the, especially the African-American speaker, anti-slavery uh, speakers, as the Fugitive Slave Act, which uh, stepped up the penalties for helping fugitive slaves. So after 1855, we see that this large community, Florence being 10% African-American in 1850 census, um, many left for Canada after the Fugitive Slave Law, ending a, a yet another utopian dream of an interracial community here in Florence that was established for a brief period. 10% is an unheard of figure in cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia had 6, 7% perhaps, New Bedford 7%. Florence, not North, Northampton as such, but Florence was 10% African American in 1850, a very interesting phenomenon here. So we're going to move on to the next site, um, but remember the Pine Grove, because uh, this is where it really happened, and you can come here and see these and feel these uh, spirits here.
The natural question might be, what was in Florence before the Northampton Association uh, came together, and why did they actually come to this spot as opposed to any other? Remember, there was this depression in 1837, so people were looking at, around for a way to make a living. And so what happened was, in, in, 1830, in around 1835-36, there was founded here in Florence the Northampton Silk Company. And right at this spot where we are now, uh, and this is the, really the important feature on the Mill River that brought people here, here is where the 28-foot drop was in the river where they could get the water privilege, it was called. And this was really the most valuable part, when you think about it, of the land up here in Florence was the drop in the river at that point where they could get power to drive mills up here. So the very first, and this was known, you know, way back, and so the earliest one was Josiah White's uh, oil mill, which we have a picture of here, thanks to uh, Charles Sheffield's uh, History of Florence. This is an illustration. And we're right at this site right now. And very, uh, you know, this is an important site from through the years in Florence. And uh, early on, the farmers in the valley up here would bring their linseed for uh, expressing up here at the, uh, at, the, at the linseed oil mill of Josiah White. Samuel Whitmarsh bought a lot of the land up here, close to 400 acres he put together up here, including this oil mill. And he converted the oil mill to the production of silk. And his vision was to grow silk, uh, grow the actual mulberry trees that the silkworms would be fed, the leaves that uh, would be fed to the to the, uh, to the worms and grow silk from scratch. This later on proved to be part of the undoing of the association. Doing that, growing the, growing the mulberry trees, feeding the silkworms was almost like a distraction from the real profit making part of the silk, which was actually making the silk thread. But that was his vision and here he planted mulberry trees all over the place and at the time uh, as they're coming out of the depression, people were trying to make money any way they could and they speculated in these mulberry trees. The price of a mulberry tree went through the roof. And in 1839, all of that came collapsing down. So this property that Whitmarsh had put so much money into came on the market for like twenty or thirty thousand dollars. And the people down there in Brooklyn, Connecticut, in the northeastern section of Connecticut, where the abolitionists had become aware of, the, uh, aware of each other, Samuel Hill, um, George W. Benson, and others heard about, heard about this incredibly rich uh, source of income up here in Northampton. And so they came up here and bought up the property at, at cheap for, from the, uh, the now bankrupt silk company. So just before that had happened, and again, this is a reason why I believe why they moved here, Lydia Mariah Child and her husband David Lee Child came here. They were also some of the most prominent abolitionists from Boston, uh, came here to try and raise sugar beets uh, consciously to provide an alternate to slave-grown sugar cane. So sugar beets was this other source of, possible source of sugar that free blacks possibly could work on up here in the north and other people to provide this other way to get sugar. They were part of the free labor movement in that respect. She was one of the most prominent writers of the, of the day, actually. Before Harriet Beecher Stowe, Lydia Mariah Child was probably the, the best known woman uh, author of the day. And she came here and uh, with her husband after having converted to abolitionism she paid the price of, uh, of all that fame. Her uh, bestseller, The Frugal Housewife, sales of that dried up. Sales of her, her magazine, The Juvenile Miscellany, which she had promoted and built up, those dried up. This was in Massachusetts, where you paid a price to be an abolitionist in the 1830s. Garrison, on the other hand, called her the first woman of the republic. And she came here uh, with her husband to, now that she no longer was making the money she formerly had made from the sales of her books to try this experiment. Well, they did, and they came here and put their 
after Whitmarsh moved his um, after he moved his silk making fact, uh, material to this uh, larger silk factory down the river, David Lee Child put in sugar beet manufacturing equipment into the same mill. Later on, the Utopian community, when they came, uh, put uh, their manufacturing uh, uh, equipment to, for grist, uh, for, as a grist mill and also on the same site a sawmill, which was they diversified from silk to some extent. They had a farm, uh, where, which we'll visit later, uh, a farm here to raise the uh, crops for the uh, community. They also had a, a planing machine, which they had a patent on. So they tried, they, they tried different ways uh, to not have all their eggs in the silk basket at that point. We've been very fortunate here in Florence over the last four or five years to have had really wonderful historians beginning to take notice of just how uh, rich uh, the history of Florence is and how it's still, it is um, an, a compact site for interpretation of abolition era history. The Stetson letters were uh, found recently in the last five or six years in an attic in New Jersey of descendants of the uh, Stetsons, James and Dolly Stetson. And one of the reasons why we have this rich volume of letters uh, written between 1844 and 1847 is that James Stetson became the, one of the principal sellers of silk for the utopian community. He came here like others from Brooklyn, Connecticut, was uh, a parishioner of Samuel J. May, like many of the other founders here, who was a, the only Unitarian minister in Connecticut at that point, and an, one of the most ardent abolitionists. So they, they came here, and James was hired to become, go to Boston, actually live in Boston for the most part, selling the wares of the uh, utopian community here and trying his best to build up the silk trade. So that situation naturally generated uh, these letters where Dolly would write to James, ask him for advice, tell it, give him the news of the community. James would write back, uh, I think in a way, try, uh, he had a great sense of humor. We have very few of the letters he wrote. The ones we do have are really a wonderful read. Dolly was clearly more educated than James, wrote in a clear fashion. Um, and they came here in many ways to educate their children because, if, remember, this was the Northampton uh, Association of Education and Industry. So in addition to the silk, a principal idea they had was to have a school here, a boarding school, uh, not only just for the, uh, the members of the community, but they planned to bring in students who would stay here for a year, at that point for $100 a year, and, and learn from some of the best scholars they could assemble here. The Stetson letters with, provide us with a, a really rich view into the day-to-day -day life of what it was like to be a member of the Northampton Association. And one of the people that we learn a lot more about is Sojourner Truth herself, who was a friend of Dolly Stetson's. And uh, on, a, on July 26, 1844, Dolly wrote this to James. On Thursday, Mr. Hammond's little child passed to the spirit land. It has been a great sufferer, a long time. Its flesh was all wasted off its body and the funeral was Thursday at four o'clock. Mary Bryant composed a hymn which was sung by the young people at the funeral. Another hymn w w was selected by Mrs. Hammond and was sung. Remarks were made by Mr. Boyle, Mack, and Bassett. Sojourn also spoke with much feeling and sang something on the death of an infant. The services were said to be very solemn and impressive. It rained very fast and I did not go over. Each of the children belonging to the junior and infant class had bouquets of evergreens and flowers mingled, which they intended to have thrown into the grave upon the coffin, but as it rained, they put them into the coffin as they went to look at the corpse. We're gonna move on now to another site nearer to where the bulk of the uh, Northampton Association members lived, which was in, actually in the silk factory that they had bought from Samuel Whitmarsh. Northampton, as many of you may be aware, has, be has uh, a long history of uh, alternative medical treatment. And we're here by the Mill River 
where back in 1846, David Ruggles, a, an African-American from Norwich, Connecticut, member of the Northampton Association, established the first water cure in Northampton. Now we have a lot to learn about the water cure, but briefly it was a system of baths and drinking large quantities of uh, fresh water, carbon spring water from the spring uh, over on Spring Street here and uh, then laying on of wet towels and so as to bring on a crisis in health that would break you through whatever it was you had come to be treated for. And David Ruggles, the uh, founder, uh, came to the Northampton Association in November of 1842, having left New York City, where he had helped over 600 fugitive slaves to freedom, including Basil Dorsey, whose second house is right here uh, where we're standing. And uh, David Ruggles came here blind and in very bad health and was helped here uh, by, through uh, working with Lydia Mariah Child and David Lee Child, who put his name forward to the membership committee of the association in 1842. He became a member and while he was here, he worked without uh, ceasing to figure out what it was uh, he was sick with and um, he treated himself by learning the water cure, which was a treatment uh, technique that had been developed in Germany and that he uh, took correspondence courses with, uh, with a fellow named Wesselhoff in, in, uh, in Boston and came here and uh, after he had treated himself for 18 months, began to treat other people in the utopian community immediately around him including Sojourner Truth, including William Lloyd Garrison. And he began to think, and people actually kept asking him, why don't you set up a water cure? And so with funds from his friends here in the association, in 1846, he set up the water cure in a little house that was over here by the uh, Elks Lodge uh, on Spring Street. That house now has been moved up to the hill on Florence Road uh, and uh, still exists today. And we can't go on from the Northampton Association from the spot we're at without remembering David Ruggles, who died at the age of 39 in 1849. His treatment's finally unsuccessful in stemming off uh, what comes to all of us at one day. Here we are at the Ross Homestead. The Ross Homestead is a really, really wonderful piece of history here we have. It's a treasure in Florence. And it was at one time the agricultural department of the Northampton Association of Education and Industry. It formed part of the total 470 acres that the community owned at one point. And it was part of Broughton's Meadow, which was what Florence was really known as before the uh, Northampton Association came here. After they came here, this section was known as the community, which was uh, you know, in their honor. This has been farmland uh, back to the 17th century as uh, farmland down in the meadows in Northampton uh, became more and more scarce. Uh, they divided up sections up here on the uh, Mill River. And this, so this has been cultivated farmland since the 18th century and very rich. And today uh, we're fortunate because it's preserved as, as a, uh, an aquifer and it's in the 100 year flood plain so there can be very little d further development down here. So when you're here you see basically the Ross Homestead is it down here and it will remain so if, if, uh, unless something horrible changes. But, um, so the Ross Homestead, this building was probably built in 1825 by Gaius Burt. It was no known for a while as the Burt's Farm of Burt's Pit fame here in Northampton. And it is a part of the National Park Service's Underground Railroad Network to Freedom because we proved uh, sufficiently to the National Park Service that this was at time, or one time a station on the Underground Railroad. Austin Ross came here in 1845 and uh, was 
brought here probably by Samuel Hill. Uh, the, he was from that section of Connecticut where a lot of these uh, folks came. Hill himself lived here and his son Arthur G. Hill, the second mayor of Northampton, was born here at the Ross homestead. So here we are at the site of the silk factory building that Samuel Whitmarsh built in 1837 and which the Northampton Association bought along with 400 and plus acres in uh, 1842. Um, and here uh, most of the utopian community members lived. Uh, there's a picture we have of the uh, utopian uh, of the silk factory. Uh, right here, and right now we're behind the Perstorp factory, so you can see that it's remained an industrial situation down here. When the uh, Northampton Association took over, the holdings for places where they could live were about seven houses and this factory building. So they were, uh, and, and one other boarding house farther down the river. So they used all the space they had and one of the problems, ongoing problems of the association was where everybody was going to live. Sojourner Truth lived in this building. David Ruggles no doubt lived in this building along with at any given time around 80 other people and it was a hard life frankly for any of us who uh, uh, treasure our privacy. They had small thin dividers between families of five and six people you know living uh, right next to each other above the silk manufacturing equipment. So you can imagine that uh, as the depression ended and uh, life on the outside of the utopian community uh, got better, it began to look better as an option than living in this factory. In fact, before the association, uh, the association broke up, they sold off this factory to try and uh, deal with some of the debt that they had accumulated. So in 1845, they arranged to sell this building uh, to a consortium of local abolitionist uh, industrialists, Samuel Williston, J.P. Williston, the Hayden brothers from Haydenville, and, um, and a couple others. Uh, took over the manufacturing uh, facility and turned it into a, a cotton manufacturing facility. At that point, everybody had to move out of the factory building, so it was a scramble to see where everybody uh, was going to live. Life in the factory, we have a very interesting story told in the Stetson letters. I'd love to read that one to you. But they, at one point, renovated a section of the factory and uh, made it a nicer dining room sort of area where they could all get together and eat. Whether you lived in the community, in the uh, factory building or not, you uh, could come here and eat, even if you were living in one of the outlying houses. Oftentimes they'd come and eat in the factory building dining room. Uh, Sojourner Truth was known to be the, uh, uh, the head of the laundry department. They broke the uh, community up into as many as 10, 15 different kinds of departments. And early on, you see them generating these new departments. She was head of the laundry department, which was in the basement of the, uh, the factory building. And so they lived upstairs, manufactured silk, and, and ate upstairs, manufactured silk in the, in the uh, first floor, and in the basement, they would have other kinds of facilities there. One of the most attractive features for many of us, children of the 60s, such as myself, was the whole communitarian aspect of the Northampton Association. The idea that you would be able to have a full say in what went on in the community, and if down the road, because they weren't very profitable in the beginning, it became profitable, you would have a full share in the profits of the community. That the community would band together and provide for your room and board, you didn't have to think about certain things. Uh, like people on the outside. This was actually very attractive to Dolly Stetson, who had been had to run a house with uh, kids, worry about household budgets, worrying about the laundry, worrying about cooking. She found it a relief when she moved here in 1844, I believe, or 45, shortly after they came here. They were living in a house, and then she came and lived in the factory boarding house and wrote about 
the, the idea, she kind of kicked back and said, wow, I don't have to put the food on the table today. So that was attractive to, to some people. For others, the intrusion on privacy, um, and I'm afraid they were in the majority, was seen as a detriment, not as a, as a positive thing. But many of us that lived in communal households in the 60s and 70s went through very similar experiences to what these people went through. The idea of the work wheel and, and all the, uh, of the responsibilities of, of people that, and this was a big factor, did more or less for the community. It was quite apparent. Um, and they had a, something called mutual criticism at the community. And uh, so that at meetings, they were, uh, you were able, in fact, expected to give criticism of each other and your performance as individuals in the community and be able to take that criticism um, and take it in and not be defensive. You know, so can you imagine the personal work, really, that was expected of these people? And looking down the road, uh, looking back at it, really, what caused the final demise. This was among the factors many people look at. It was too hard, not just economically, but interpersonally to live. Uh, and that's uh, so close in such close quarters. And that's what was going on really in the factory boarding house more than in the outlying houses. So you can see why. And when you look in the records, it wasn't a big bang when they broke up at the end. They kind of had the last meeting and said, OK, it's over. And they had already started building their houses up the hill. And Samuel Hill had already planned for them where, who wanted to stay. And so it was a sort of more of a gentle transition to the new neighborhood community. And they went on being abolitionists. And they went on being women's rights activists. But they lived in their separate houses with their separate families. And the entrepreneurs, such as Hill and others, were allowed to do what they did best, which was run businesses. So it was, a, it was a change, and it was a modernization, say, of this, this time. But for those of us, we children of the 60s, you know, and I'm speaking from personal experience, they too looked back on those days with nostalgia and as some of the best years of their lives.